Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So just yesterday, I reviewed this device here. It's called the Game Force Chi. And I had some mixed feelings about it, but overall, I thought it was a very overwhelmingly positive experience. This device is just so bold and audacious that it kind of won me over. And I spent so much time in that video deliberating about this device, to the point where I wasn't able to squeeze in all the things I wanted to talk about it. And so in today's video, we're going to knock out a few of those things, show you how to set up this device, and also do a quick teardown so you can see what's inside it as well. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Now first things first, this device does not come with an SD card in it, so you're going to need to bring your own SD card to the table. I recommend getting a card that's at least 128 gigs from a good brand like SanDisk or Samsung. Now to flash the operating system onto the SD card, you need to go to this MUELEC webpage here, and I'll have a link to this in my written guide, which is in the video description. But basically all you want to do is scroll down here until you find the game force and then find the image file. It's going to be about 700 to 800 megabytes. Just go ahead and download that file, and then open it up wherever you downloaded it. And then use something like WinWare or 7-Zip to extract this file. So that way you're left with just the image file itself. It's going to be about 2 gigs or so. You can go ahead and delete the zip file after that. Next, we're going to use an app like Win32 Disk Imager to flash the image onto the SD card. So within that program, go ahead and navigate to that image file again. Make sure you have your SD card plugged into your computer and that it corresponds to the appropriate drive letter. And then just go ahead and hit the right button. It's going to ask you, do you really want to do this? And then you just click the yeah man, I want to do it button. It'll take a minute to flash and then you're done. Now if you're on a Windows PC, as soon as you're done, a bunch of windows are going to pop up and it's super annoying. Now luckily I have a video that shows you how to fix all of this. So just go ahead and find this thumbnail I'm showing off right here in my video library and it'll show you how to fix all this. Okay, so once you flash the image to your SD card, go ahead and eject it and pull it out of your computer. Next, you're going to put it into the device. After that, power on your game force. And then it's going to expand the file system in your SD card to take advantage of the entire size of the card. It'll show you a quick emulec video, and then you're in. At this point, actually all you want to do is just quit out of it. So go into the quit menu, and then shut down system to turn everything off. And you guessed it, you're going to eject the SD card, put it back into your computer. Now on your computer, you're going to see a couple different partitions. You're going to want to get the EE ROMs partition. In here, the first thing we want to do is add the BIOS files. These are the system files that are required for some consoles to run. Now I can't really tell you where to get these BIOS files because they're copyrighted, but you need to find the specific ones that your systems need. The best way to actually find the system BIOS files that you're going to need is to go onto the Emulec webpage and they'll have everything listed per system. So I would just use that as a resource in order to find the BIOS files you need for whatever system it is. Okay, so once you got your BIOS files added to your SD card, now you can start moving game files over. And this is super simple. You just find the file that corresponds to the system you want, for example, SNES for Super Nintendo, then grab your Super Nintendo files and then move them over to that folder. And you basically just rinse and repeat this for every system you want to have displayed on your device. So we'll go over to NES and do the same thing for Nintendo, and so on and so forth. Once you're done with all that, go ahead and eject the SD card, and we can now put it back in our device. Now we're ready to actually start using this thing. First thing I want to show you is how to play around with the LED lights on this device. So you go into Emulex settings, and the first option there is the button LED color. In here you can select a bunch of different colors, and you can also turn off the status LED. And then once you exit out of the Emulex settings, it'll change that setting to whatever you just chose. So you can see here, I chose the red color, and I turned off that LED indicator. But you can just go through here and try out all the different colors and see which one you like best. The red one is definitely the darkest out of all of them, but I found that I like the cyan color the most. So that's the one I'm going to use for the most part. Okay, next thing, let's go into the network settings and set up our Wi-Fi. First thing you need to do is turn on the enable Wi-Fi button. From there, you just need to find your SSID and then add your password. Then exit out of the Wi-Fi settings, and then eventually you'll see the Wi-Fi antenna symbol, and then if you press start, you'll see your IP address. Next thing to do once you've connected to the internet is to go in and install Drastic, which is the Nintendo DS emulator. You just want to go into the setup section and then find the install Drastic option. 
This will load up a new screen. You just go ahead and select yes. It'll take a second and it'll download and install Drastic. And then it'll give you a confirmation message and just go ahead and hit start to get out of this menu. Now, while we're also online, we can go into the updates and downloads section and download new themes. And some of these will actually give you a preview of the theme so you can see what it's like, but others won't actually show up. Either way, all you have to do is just click on it to pick one and then you install it in the UI settings menu. You can see here I'm using a different theme. This one's called Elect Full. I really like this one. Now another thing we can do in the updates and download section is actually update the firmware itself. So even though the 4.1 Emulec that we installed earlier is the most updated stable release, you can also download the test or the beta releases. What you do is you change the update type to beta and then you just select start update. And it's gonna ask you, do you really wanna update? And you say, yeah. At that point, it's gonna download the update file and once the download finishes, it's going to tell you to restart the device and then run through the update script. It's really handy that you can do this over Wi-Fi. Now, if you remember my review video, I talked about how the Dreamcast performance was not as good as other devices. Luckily, in this latest beta release, they have the RetroRun emulator for Dreamcast on Emulec. You got to do a couple things to actually get it started. So you have to go into the Emulec settings and go into Danger Zone and then select the option that says Reset Emulec Scripts and Binaries to Default. It's going to give you a warning page. Just go ahead and confirm. And then this will essentially restart Emulec for you. You'll even see the intro video again. Once you're back into Emulec, go ahead and press start, go into game settings, and then go into per system advanced game configuration. Within here, select Sega Dreamcast, and then change the emulator to Retro Run Flycast 32-bit. That's the one that's going to have the best performance out of all of them. Then just go ahead and hit B button a bunch of times to get out of this menu, and you've now saved it. So now, booting up a Dreamcast game, you'll see performance is much better. I'd say this is probably a good 30 to 40% better than I was showing in my previous video. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a frames per second indicator, and no other menu options available in this emulator. But all the same, you can just definitely feel and see that it plays a lot better. So now let's take a minute to talk about scaling on this device when it comes to the display itself. Now the GameForce Qi has a 640x480 display with a 4x3 aspect ratio that makes it ideally suited in terms of aspect ratio for a lot of the classic systems. But aspect ratio isn't everything when it comes to scaling a device. Resolution is actually a very important factor. So let's take the most common resolution from the Nintendo, which is 256 by 224 pixels. If you were going to display this on the device at its original resolution, it would look something like this small square here on the device. Now, even though that's very small, your pixels are gonna be just perfect because it's exactly how they're supposed to look. Now, RetroArch has the ability to do what they call integer scaling, which basically means that it'll double up or even triple up the amount of pixels to account for the size of the resolution of whatever display it's working with. So for the GameForce Qi, that would bump up the integer scaling to 2x, which now means it would be showing 512 by 448 pixels. That's a perfect 2x integer scaling of the original NES output. But like I mentioned, the GameForce Qi is 640 by 480. And so if you were gonna do integer scaling, you would have perfect pixels, but then everything that you see in the red here would be bezels around the display. And so if you wanted, you could actually just expand it to the entirety of the display. That means you wouldn't have any wasted space, but everything that gets expanded would basically have some sort of pixel distortion. And it's gonna be very minor for something like the Nintendo, but if that's something that's important to you, then you have to make a choice. Are you either gonna do integer scaling for 2X and then deal with those bezels around it? Or you could use something like a shader, which is gonna smooth out those distorted pixels. So let me show you what I mean in a game. So here's Mario 3 running at the full resolution here, which means there is some minor pixel distortion. If we go into the RetroArch settings and we go into scaling, and then we change the integer scaling to be on, you can see that the screen size gets a little bit smaller. And those are those black borders I was talking about. Not the end of the world here, and this is gonna give you perfect pixels. But if you wanted to turn the integer scaling off, you can see it's gonna to expand to that. And then what you wanna do is go into the shader section within the quick menu. And usually I suggest this shader here, which is called Sharp Bilinear 2X Prescale. And that's basically how you would get perfect pixels on a 640 by 480 display with systems like Nintendo and Super Nintendo. But I really just breeze through the whole RetroArch side of things. And that's because you don't need to know any of this in Emulec you can actually do all these changes within that system there. So let me show you how to do that. So you just press start, you go into game settings, then per system advanced configuration, 
and then select whatever system you want to adjust, and then select shader set. And then within here, all you have to do is just scroll down until you find the shader you want. Like I mentioned before, the one I prefer is called Sharp Bilinear 2x Prescale. So all you have to do is press A to select that, and then B a bunch of times to back out of this menu, and now you've applied that to all Nintendo games. And it's as simple as that. Then you can go through and go to the Super Nintendo and do the same thing for that one, Sega Genesis, so on and so forth. What this means is you're going to be able to take advantage of the entire screen while still having very nice pixels. It's going to make your image just a tiny bit softer, but I think it's very fitting for retro systems like this anyway. Now another issue I had in my review was the fact that these buttons didn't work very well for certain platformers. For example, if you hold down on the B button and then try to press the A button with the other part of your thumb, it doesn't work very well. What ends up happening instead of pushing down is you push against the button. And that's because these buttons wobble so much. And it's very frustrating when you're playing a platforming game because instead of pushing the button down, you're going to miss it or you're going to be late. And when you're in the heat of the moment, you're trying to jump on some Goombas, it just totally sucks. So let me show you what I've done to make my life a little bit easier. You want to go into the RetroArch menu by pressing Home and X. And then in the Quick menu, go down to Controls, then Port 1 Controls. Within here, we're going to remap the face buttons. Instead of A being A, we're going to turn B to A. So we're just going to go ahead and change this B button down to A. And then we're going to change Y to B. And for Nintendo as well, it's a good idea to change the X button to the Turbo B button and the A button to the Turbo A button. What this setup is going to do is going to make the game perform a lot like Super Mario World. So now Y is B and B is A. So once we have that set, let's go ahead and save this configuration. You can save the remap file so it'll only work for a specific game, or you can do it by content directory so everything in the NES folder, or you can do it by core so every time this core opens up, this is what the button mapping will look like. Because I want to use this for every Nintendo game, I'm going to select the save core remap file. Okay, so let me show you what it looks like in the game. So now the B button is the jump button and the Y button is the run button. This is exactly like how it is set up in Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo, and it's a very comfortable position. And now the meat of your thumb is going to be pushing down on it instead of the side of your thumb. It might take your brain a second to get used to this new setup, but once it clicks, it's very easy. So I'd recommend you do this for any of your handheld or two button systems on this device. For me, it makes the controls a lot easier to use. Now one quick tip here, to exit out of game, all you have to do is press the home button and then the start button twice, and that'll boot you back to the main menu. Okay, let me show off a couple more tips in Emulec. First thing is, if you press the Y button anytime in the menu, you can search for certain games. So for example, if I search for the word Mario, it's going to pull up every game that has the word Mario in it. So that's a very easy way to pull up a game instead of having to navigate to the system and then scroll down through your library to find the specific game. It might be just faster to type in one word and then find it right there. So just like that, we can start up Paper Mario on the Nintendo 64. Okay, one more quick tip here. I just wanted to mention the fact that the default theme for Emulec, which is called Crystal, actually has a 4x3 version, but it's not set by default. But this is a really easy fix. So you just go ahead and hit Start, go into UI Settings, then Theme Configuration, and then you can find Screen Ratio, and change that to 4x3 with 480p. And that's it. Once you exit out, you can see you have a full screen theme now. It looks a lot better this way. And of course, because this device has built-in Wi-Fi, it's very easy to scrape box art and media for your games. So you just go into the scrape menu, and then you figure out whatever parameters you want. And then you add your username and password from screenscraper.fr, and away you go. It'll start downloading all of your game media, and it'll transform your menu from looking like something like this to something like this. And depending on what you select, you can have game videos and things like that as well. Okay, we've been going at this for a bit now. Let's go ahead and do a cat break. It's been a while since we did one of these. So this is my cat chicken, and I always like to show her whenever she's on my lap and I'm recording a video. Now, unfortunately, it's getting to be summer here in Hawaii, and it's just getting way too hot for chicken to want to sit on anybody's lap right now. For example, in our house, because we don't have AC, it's getting into the high 80s and sometimes the low 90s during the day. And it's kind of unbearable, and the last thing I want is a furry animal on my lap. As cute as chicken is, she's not getting on my lap at that point. So I'll be sure to film her anytime she's on my lap while I'm recording, but just know she's around, she's having a great time. Alright, let's get back to work.
Next, we're gonna do a teardown. I'm gonna show you everything that's inside the device itself so you can get an idea of what's there and also so I can get an idea of what kind of mods I wanna do in the future. So to take the device apart, super simple, just go ahead and remove the screws and then use your thumb to go along the seam here to undo all of the clips that hold it together. After that, you can remove the battery. And here we are with the main board. First thing I want to point out are the analog sticks here. There's a little bit of tape here holding the ribbons in, and I think that's a nice touch to make sure it doesn't rip out. Now looking at the analog stick assembly, it's very clear that they're using the same thing that's used on the PS Vita. As you can see here, they matched right up. Now you could, in theory, go and buy some PS Vita analog sticks and then put them in this device. And it might feel a little bit better than how they do now, but I don't think they're a very good fit because the PS Vita sticks are just too small. So I don't think I'm gonna swap them out with PS Vita sticks. Instead, what I plan on doing is looking for different PS Vita caps and then trying those out instead. So to take the main board out, you're gonna to wanna to remove the ribbon cables for these analog sticks, and then take out the six screws that hold in the PCB. To make everything easier, you could take out the shoulder and trigger buttons, but I will say the trigger buttons are kind of firmly in there, so you don't really have to do this. Once you've got that all set up, all you have to do then is just kind of pry the PCB away. I would recommend doing it from the top down. But be very gentle when you're doing it, because the LCD panel is actually connected to the front of the PCB. And there's no adhesive holding it in place with the device itself. So you can just pull that away very carefully. On the edges here, you can see there are two rumble motors. And then under these membranes, you can find the D-pad as well as the face buttons. Let's take a look at the face buttons real quick. Honestly, I was hoping that these would protrude a little bit from the bottom of them, and then I could file them down so that way the buttons wouldn't stick out so much at the front of the case. But unfortunately, as you can see here, there's no extra space at the bottom of this button. So I can't file it down from the bottom up at all. And I don't think there's enough space there to kind of sand it down from the top down either. So I think when it comes down to it, we're probably not gonna be able to modify these buttons to improve the gameplay experience. Instead, somebody is either gonna to have to find or build new replacement buttons for this device. So that's a bit of a letdown. I was hoping it would be a bit of an easier fix. And then the last thing to point out here up top are the speakers. These don't look to be easy to replace either, but they're nice speakers, so I don't think it's a big deal. Okay, so that's it in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and put everything back together. We're just gonna do everything in reverse order. So I'm gently gonna lay in the LCD panel as well as the main board. And then make sure you gently pry up those analog stick ribbon cables so that way you have easy access to them. Next, secure the main board back into the device, add your shoulders and triggers, and then reseat your ribbon cables for your analog sticks. And I'm gonna add the tape again just because they had it on the first time. Now let's look at the battery for a second. I was hoping that we could add a larger battery to this device. For example, here's the Odroid Go Super battery, but unfortunately I think it's just too thick. I worry that if you were to put this in here, it would press up against the CPU when you put it back together. And to me, that's gonna be a straight up fire hazard. So I'm not gonna do that. So let's just reconnect the battery here. And then snap the device back together using those clips that we removed earlier. And add the screws again. Now we're done. All right, everyone, really that's it for this video. I wanted to show you some tips and tricks in order to get set up with the GameForce Qi. And there's a lot more you could do with this, especially as you're learning more about Emulek. So I encourage you to check out the Emulek wiki page on their GitHub. And the jury's still out about what kind of mods I can do this device. I'm really determined to fix this button issue at some point. So as soon as I find a solution for that, you can bet you're gonna see a video on it. And maybe someday someone will also make an OCA laminated display. Who knows? Anyway, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming!